How do we build a beer recipe? Let's do it together. Welcome back brewers and beer lovers to Flying Wombat TV, the channel all about beer, banter, and bloody good times. So, dramatic opener aside, yes, we are talking about how to make a beer recipe today for all grain brewers from start to finish from scratch. So, don't forget to like and subscribe, and throughout this video, we're gonna do an example for you, build a recipe on the fly, and then brew it on our next brew day. Let's get into it. Step number one, choose what style of beer you wanna make. Yes, seems like an obvious and a bit of a stupid statement, but it's very important because before you plan anything, you need to know specifically what type of beer you're making. Something like a fresh pale ale has a very different profile of ingredients from something like a, you know, thick chocolatey stout. So figure out what specific style you want to make, but to determine what style you can make, it depends on what factors are in play. Specifically, something like environmental conditions. If you're down here in Australia going into summer right now, you're gonna hit some 40 degrees Celsius days, you know, whatever that is in Fahrenheit, like 100 degrees or something, I don't know, maybe more. It's gonna get hot. If you're trying to brew a lager, it's just not gonna work. The yeast are gonna get stressed out, it's gonna taste disgusting. If you're, you know, in a colder climate up in the north of uh, North America right now, maybe you need to brew a lager and you need to make use of those conditions. Brew for the conditions that are available to you based on the equipment that you have. Second thing is gonna be time. If you only have a week to brew something just in time for your office Christmas party, you know, brewing a slow fermenting lager is gonna be, you know, out of the question. But using a Kevaic, um yeast that ferments really aggressively and really fast will be available to you. So maybe brew a IPA or an IPA that can deal with a really fast fermentation. Brew with the conditions that are available to you to determine what style that you can make. Step number two, uh, pick a broad flavor profile. So what I mean by that is start broad with a wide open funnel and then you narrow down your recipe as you go through each ingredient, you know, group. So starting broadly speaking, do you want to make a, you know, let's say we've chosen a pale ale. Do you want it to be earthy? Do you want it to be spicy? Do you want it to be fruity? Do you want it to be really bitter? Do you want it to be really sweet? Determine in broad strokes kind of what flavor profile you're going for. And then that's going to help you narrow down what grains you're going to use, what hops you're going to use, what yeast you're going to use. So pick some broad flavor profiles to begin with, and then you can narrow it down further. Step number three. This one is going to be a bit of a long step because it's talking about ingredients. We're going to go through each of the ingredient types and then break down each of the different factors that those ingredients play in your final product. Step 3.1. Grains. What grains do we want to use? Uh, let's start from the beginning. We're going to talk about flavor and mouthfeel. So those come hand in hand. If we want to say make a pale ale, we need to determine what kind of pale ale we want to make. If we are going for an Australian style pale ale, the Australian malts are fairly clean, but they do have a little bit more of that biscuity, bready character. If we're going for an American style pale ale, it's going to be a much cleaner base malt. It's really letting the other flavors and aromas shine through in the beer. So determine which type of beer you want to make. That's going to tell you what base malt you need to use. After that, you need to think about your specialty grains. If we're going for the Australian style, Generally, we want this to be quite a crisp beer, so we're probably not going to use a whole lot of sweet malts, like a caramel malt or a crystal malt. If we're going for the American style, they tend to be much hoppier. They're quite hop forward uh, pale ales. So to balance the hoppiness, you need to have a decent amount of crystal malt in there. So if it was the American style, 5% of our grain bill is probably going to be something like a medium crystal malt. If it was an Australian, we might not even use any crystal malt at all. So determine what kind of flavor you want. That's going to tell you what kind of mouthfeel you're going to get. The more specialty malt you use, the thicker, chewer your mouthfeel you're going to have at the end because there's more unfermentable sugars left in the final product. All right, next part of the grains, we need to figure out what kind of ABV we want. We need to figure out what kind of color we want and what a amount of, uh, of grains we need to use to get those factors. So if we're going for, I don't know, let's say a, uh, a red ale, we know we want a red color. It's characteristic of that style. So maybe 70 to probably max 80% of our grain bill is gonna be our base malt. Maybe like, I don't know, an ale malt, whatever you want. But then the next 20 to 30% of that grain bill must be specialty malts that are contributing to that ruby red color. So you could go down the route of using stuff like 
chocolate malt to really just darken it and then maybe you're using something like a red back or an aurora or some really dark crystal malt to get more of that red hue coming through you need to determine what color you want that's going to tell you how much specialty malt of what style you need to get to that color from there you also need to figure out what kind of abv you want the more specialty malt you use the lower the final abv will be because there's more unfermentable sugars inside your beer so that's also going to determine how much grains you actually have to use for the amount of water you're using if you're going high abv you need a higher grain to water ratio going lower abv you're going the other way around it's um you know a bit of food for thought think about your ratios quick addition for the grains not only do we need to figure out what to use and how much to use, we also need to think about temperature, specifically with our mash temperature. Do we want more residual sugars at the end and a thicker mouthfeel? We're going to go towards a higher mash temperature, maybe, you know, for a stout or something really thick and heavy and creamy. We might lean towards like 71 degrees Celsius, that in Fahrenheit. If we wanted something that's going to be really clean, really crisp, really dry, we're going to lean way towards the lower end, maybe like 65 degrees Celsius, that in Fahrenheit. The idea is higher temperature, more residual sugar, bigger mouthfeel, lower temperature, drier finish, more alcohol. Step number 3.2, hops. We need to figure out what kind of flavor we want to determine what kind of hops and how much hops we are going to use. We're gonna break this down into a couple of parts, starting with flavor and aroma. So that's simply about what kind of stuff do we want to smell and taste on our final product? If we're leaning towards a really fruity style of beer, maybe like a Nipa, for example, we're going to lean heavily into the New World style of hops. So we'll have a lot of Galaxy, El Dorado, Mosaic, all those really punchy, fruity, tropical fruit, stone fruit style of hops. It's going to give us that really juicy smell on the nose and those really boozy, juicy flavors on the palate. Next, we need to think about bitterness, balance, and to an extent, you know, clarity of our final product. So starting with bitterness and balance, they work hand in hand. If we are going for a really, you know, bitter West Coast IPA or a double IPA, we're gonna use a lot of hops with high alpha acids, especially at the start of the boil. We want that alpha acid isomerization to create that bittering mouthfeel effect. If we're leaning towards a Anipa, for example, we want very little bitterness, but we want maximum hoppiness. So we're gonna use as little hops as possible at the start of the boil to reduce that isomerization, but we're gonna throw in heaps of hops, you know, at the whirlpool stage or at the end of the boil at the late, late, late additions. So think about what kind of uh, bitterness you want. That's gonna tell you when to add your hops and how you need to balance that product. Because if you're making a really bitter style of beer, you need the alcohol and the sweetness of that beer from the malts to balance it together in that holy trinity. So we mentioned hop timings, but a little bit deeper. We need to think about not only the hop timings for, you know, what kind of flavor profiles we want to get out of our hops, i.e. do you want more juiciness without the bitterness, more bitterness, more whatever, but we also need to think about the timings in terms of clarity. If we're using our hops in the traditional sense, you know, we say we're doing a bunch of hops at the 60 minute mark at the start of boil, then we do a bunch of hops around 15 or 10 minutes, we're gonna end up having a pretty clear beer. And that's kind of preferable for something like a West Coast IPA. But if we're going for a hazy or a Nipa, for example, we're gonna wanna throw more hops in at the end of boil or at flame out or at whirlpool, which means we're gonna have a lot more of those hop oils floating around and that's gonna create a much cloudier, more turbid beer. So do we want clarity or do we want haziness? You need to make up your mind. 3.3, yeast. I don't wanna burst the bag, but yeah, we're gonna talk about yeast. <laughs> Talking about yeast, there's a couple things that go into this. We're gonna start with um, flavor and aroma, generally speaking. So if we're thinking about, you know, making something that's say like a Belgian triple, for example, super estery, super aromatic beer, which largely comes from the yeast that are used and how those yeasties are used. So if um, we want something along those estery lines, we're gonna wanna use a more Bavarian or more Belgian style yeast that's gonna really produce that esterification. 
If we want something really clean and really crisp and we want the hop or the malt character to shine through, like say an American pale ale or an Australian pale ale, we're probably gonna use more of a clean fermenting yeast, like a USO5, for example. That's gonna really let the malts and the hops shine through. So make up your mind about how much esters and how much uh, flavor contribution you want from the yeast. That's gonna tell you what yeast to use. Next thing with our yeasties, finish and ABV. So look, for this one, Finish does come with hops, it comes with malts, but it does also come with yeast. It's kind of along the same lines as flavor and aroma. How crisp and clean do you want that beer to finish? If you want to finish really crisp, you're gonna want a yeast that can really munch up all the remaining sugars, but leave it with a dry finish. So if we're making a lager, for example, we're gonna choose something like maybe an S23 from Safael. That's gonna make a really crisp finishing beer with a touch of esterification to add to that fruity character. If we want something that's gonna really linger in the mouth and provide that long lasting effect after we've swallowed, again, we're gonna to lean towards something that produces a ton of esters like a Belgian style or a Bavarian wheat beer style yeast. And then we're thinking about the ABV. So, if we want more booze in our product, like say we're going for a West Coast IPA or maybe like a double IPA, and we want this to be like seven, eight percent or something, we're gonna want a yeast that can finish quite dry, that can really munch up all of those sugars available to it, besides the unfermentable sugars. We wanted to use up all of that stuff to pump out more alcohol. If we're going for a really low alcohol beer, like maybe like, I don't know, three and a half percent pale ale, we just want a session beer, we're maybe gonna want something that's gonna leave a little bit of residual sugars left in the product so that we can preserve some of that mouthfeel as well as not produce too much alcohol. So think about how much ABV you want in the final product. That's also gonna to contribute to what yeast you use. Lastly, once again, we're talking about temperature. This time it's not about mashing, it's about fermentation. And this one's pretty simple, honestly. Like, just follow the instructions of what that yeast provider has told you to do. So for example, here we have um, Oz 05, which is like a copycat of the US 05. So we know that we're going to want to ferment around that 20 degrees Celsius mark. That in, you know, Fahrenheit. You want to follow the guidelines of the yeast producers. They know what works best for that yeast. Just do what they do. Generally speaking though, if you want more esterification, push it to a higher temperature. If you want it to be cleaner, push it towards the lower end of the, of the scale. Step 3.4. Adjuncts. What other random shit are we gonna throw into our beer? Adjuncts. Basically it means whatever additional ingredients that we're gonna throw into here that are outside of you know, the core four and being like water, yeast, hops, and uh, malts. So it depends on what you're going for here. For example, we make an, a, a, a pina colada pale ale, which obviously means we need pineapple and we need coconut. We need those flavors that are not readily available in traditional ingredients. Maybe you're an extract brewer and you need to bump up your ABV a little bit. Your adjunct is probably going to be something like raw sugar, table sugar, dextrose, something like that. Uh, let's say you're going for a chocolate stout like we did, uh, you know, little card down there if you want to see that brew day. We did a cocoa nibs chocolate stout. So we actually used the cacao nibs, toasted them and then threw them into the beer. That gave us that extra boost in chocolate flavor. Basically, Determine if you want to make a specialty beer that actually uses ingredients outside of the normal four, or if you want to really uh, just keep it simple and stick to those mainstream stuff. You need to make your own decision there. So along those lines, we've discussed flavor and aroma. That's kind of obvious. What flavors do you want? But then we also need to consider ABV and mouthfeel. If we're adding a ton of sugar to something, it's going to give the yeast more fuel to keep fermenting. It's gonna make more alcohol. You need to account for that extra ABV boost. Um, you can generally find out how much fermentable sugars something has with online sites. We'll put links down below. But you know, if you add you know, sugar, for example, it's gonna add a lot more fermentable sugar than say adding pineapple, pureed pineapple, or pureed raspberries, something like that. Next thing you need to consider is that mouthfeel. The more booze you produce, uh, the more it's gonna throw that mouthfeel out of whack. So you need to counterbalance that mouthfeel character. If you add a ton of sugar to something like with an extract brew, maybe use like oats or wheat or something to soften it up and provide more silkiness to balance out the sharpness that comes from fermenting sugar. Balance the mouthfeel with the adjunct you're using. Step 3.5, water. Now, 
Water chemistry is probably going to be a whole nother topic and we'll do an entirely separate video on that because it does get a little bit complex. But generally speaking, think about how much water you need to use for what ABV you want, how much mouthfeel you want, all of that stuff. So more water, less ABV, weaker mouthfeel, less water, thicker mouthfeel, potentially more ABV. Think about that. And then also think about, you know, if there's a lot of chlorine in your water that you're using, you need to balance that because it's going to add a bit of a chlorinated off flavor, you know, link to the off flavors video over there somewhere. If you've got a lot of uh, fluoride, you've got a lot of salts, you know, just think about how soft or hard the water is. But, you know, we'll do a proper water chemistry video in coming weeks. Advice. Um, these are all the steps and this is the general, you know, mind map I follow when I'm making a recipe. But I do have a, a couple points of advice for you guys here. Um, firstly would be, you know, keep it simple, stupid, or keep it stupid, simple, however you want to say it. Basically, don't overcomplicate what you're trying to do. There's only so much flavor you can get in something from adding so many ingredients. And it doesn't, look, making a beer more complex and adding 10 different, you know, specialty malts and eight different hops and all these different adjuncts, it's not necessarily going to make a better beer. So in some ways, it's, it's kind of better to keep it a little bit stupid simple. Focus on the main flavor profiles you want and chase those profiles. Don't make your focus simply making it more complex for the sake of being complex. Second bit of advice would be along the same lines, change less variables. If you're in the process of trying to perfect a recipe, and this kind of comes into our top 10 tips videos for that all home brewers should know, link over there. Um, change less variables just so that you know what ingredients contribute, what flavor, what balance, what ABV, etc. If you change too much stuff at once, you're not gonna know what characteristics or what factors influence what flavors. So change less stuff when you're fixing and improving a recipe. And then, uh, you know, third to last would be, if you are making a style that's totally outside of your comfort zone, you've never made it before, use an existing template. So use a recipe on a brewer's forum, on Facebook, online, whatever, that a bunch of people have made and a bunch of people have been happy with. Use that as a template and then make tweaks to it as you see fit. Use something as a rough outline, as your blueprints to figure out exactly how much water you might need to the grain ratio, what ratio of specialty malts to base malts, how much hops per liter at this step or at that step. It gives you kind of a good starting platform to make your tweaks from there. Last bit of advice would be just brew. Just brew, man. Like, don't stress too much about trying to figure out the perfect recipe with all your spreadsheets and all your notes and whatever. If you're curious about what something's gonna do, just brew it. The worst thing that's gonna happen is you're gonna make the beer, it's gonna be a little bit shit, and you're gonna be like, oh, well, I don't wanna drink that. Guess what? You get to make another beer. It's really not the worst thing in the world. So just, when in doubt, just brew it out. That's my advice. All right, we've gone through all of our steps. Let's make a recipe on the fly. Following the same process. Step one, what style of beer do we want to make? In this case, we're going to keep it pretty simple. A few of you have been asking for our recipe for the Australian lager, and uh, you know we just didn't release it last time. It was one of our first brew day videos. So we're going to make it again. We're going to try and make it better. We're going to make an Australian lager. Step two, what kind of broad strokes flavor profile do we want? Our Australian lager traditionally, well, Australian lagers in general traditionally, we're more on the herbal side when it comes to hop character kind of herbal, earthy, grassy, that type of thing. For ours, we want it to be more new world, really fresh, zesty, and uh, a little bit fruity. So we want a clean finish, we want a light body, and we want to lean into the fruity, zesty characteristics. Step three, grains. In this case, we've made it quite simple for ourselves. It's an Australian lager. We want it to be really clean, crisp, and fresh, which means the grains are not gonna be the star of the show. So in this case, we're just gonna use one grain, it's gonna be a single grain mash bill. We're just gonna use uh, Barrett Burston uh, Lager Malt, Pilsner Malt. So that's it. We only want the malt to provide the sugar and that light body, light mouthfeel. We don't want it to do much more than that. So we're gonna keep it simple with one grain. We need to think about how much we need per the you know water ratio. Generally, we make like two kegs worth at a time. So we end up with about 50 to 55 liters of beer in our fermenter. In that case, we want it to be around the ABV of, well, like four and a half percent. We want to lean on the lighter side as far as the grains go. So we'll probably go nine kilos of grain and something like, I don't know, 30 liters of uh, strike water and then like 35 liters of um, sparging water. Right, next step, hops. What kind of hops do we want? 
We want to stick to the new world style of things. We also want to stick with Australian hops because we want this to be a truly Australian lager. So what are our options? Basically, the way I see it, we've got three more or less. We want to use Galaxy for sure. We want that passion fruit, uh, tropical citrusy aroma and flavor. So Galaxy absolutely has to be in there. Next one that I want is Topaz. If you can't get Topaz where you are in the States, I'm sorry, but it's a brilliant hop. So it's similar to Galaxy, but it's really leaning more into tropical flavors as opposed to the uh, passion fruit and citrus flavors of Galaxy. But it's interesting because when you use Topaz as a dry hop addition, it provides kind of resinous and grassy notes, which balance nicely against the citrus. Uh, if we want one more hop in there, what do we want? What do we want? Um, let me think. <laughs> let me think. What, what, what do I want? I figured it out. My third hop. Pride of Ringwood. I've never used it. I've always wanted to use it. It's a distinctly, probably our oldest running uh, style of hop in Australia. Came out in like 1958 or something and it's been in tons of Australian beers since. So we should probably use it in this one. We'll throw some Pride of Ringwood in there. Now, thinking about uh, what kind of, uh, you know, bitterness we want and, um, you know, how we want to throw our hops into all of this, let's go through the numbers a little bit. We want, don't want it to be a super bitter beer. We want it to be bitter enough to balance it because the complaint we had with our last one was that it was a bit too sweet and the bitterness didn't make up for it. The bitterness was lacking. So let's go 10 grams of Galaxy at the start of the boil. Then we've got three hops. We don't want it to be super hop heavy. We'll go... 40 grams of each in the last five minutes of the boil. Want it to be clear, so we don't want to do whirlpooling. We do want that touch of end of boil bitterness, but we want them to be, uh, I summarize the touch and uh, you know provide that more traditional style of uh, aromatic and uh, flavoring hops. So last five minutes of the boil is I think what we're gonna run with here. Uh, next, we need to think about what kind of yeast we want to use, what characters we want. Uh, in this case, we do need to cheat a little bit. Australia doesn't have a massive variety in terms of lager yeast that are readily available for home brewers. So we're going to cheat a little bit. We're going to be using White Labs high pressure lager yeast. Two reasons. One, White Labs always makes just fantastic products. They're always reliable. They're always great. Two, I've been super keen to try the high pressure lager yeast for two reasons. One, it ferments fast as far as lagers go. Two, when you ferment at high pressure, it makes a much cleaner, crisper flavor profile. I really want that characteristic in my finished products for a lager. So we're gonna run with a high pressure lager yeast. Uh, temperature, um, we can. it's high pressure, so we can actually ferment quite hot as far as lagers go. I still wanna be on the safe side. I'll ferment at 18 degrees Celsius, which is 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Give me a thumbs up if I'm right. We'll see. Uh, quick mention worth bringing up, I guess, clarity. Generally speaking, if you're using a lager yeast and you have the ability to cold crash and let it lager out at lager temperatures, it's going to end up being very clear. All that yeast and sediment's going to drop to the bottom. So yeah, that yeast should be fine. Uh, finally, adjuncts. None. <laughs> it's a lager. It's, it's just meant to be a beer that tastes like beer. We're not going to throw any adjuncts into this. We don't need to mess around with it. We're keeping it simple. Stupid simple. So that's a wrap, guys. Start to finish, grain to glass, from scratch, how to make your own all-grain beer recipe. So as we said at the start, we're going to make that recipe that we just did on the fly with you guys on our next brew day. So I guess we'll catch you then, let you know how it turned out. And uh, until then, don't forget to like and subscribe and brew on, guys. Cheers.